So I grew up uh, in the Presbyterian Church. The Pro that's a Protestant denomination. You know, there's many different Protestant denominations. What grew? What church did you grow up in? Non-denominational. Non it's like a local church that's just a Christian church. Mine was part of the Presbyterian Church, and only because my mom liked the preacher because we listened to him on the radio. So growing up, my experience of church was sitting around the breakfast table on Sunday morning and getting real quiet and turning the radio on and listening to about a 45-minute homily. Now, does Father Hall preach 45 minutes on Sundays? No. I think you guys would probably protest if he did. But in the Protestant church, which is really an interesting thing to... I just thought of this. The interesting difference is in the Protestant church, since they don't have the Mass, the Holy Eucharist, and I saw these, these little preschool pictures of these hands of the priest holding up the mm -hmm. host. Um, in the Protestant church, they don't believe in... They just have one sacrament, and that's the sacrament of baptism. <laughs> and so they don't believe in the other six sacraments. So they don't have the Eucharist, and they don't have you know, confession or, you know, there's other sacraments like the Catholic Church uh, has. And so we really didn't, um, you know, go to church for the sacraments. We went to church for the sermon, for the homily. And if the preacher was really good, then that was a really popular church. And I grew up in Kansas City, um, and there was, this, there was this preacher by the name of Dr. Robert Manili, who was so popular he had a radio program and everybody tuned in to him on Sundays if you weren't Catholic and tuned in to him on Sunday mornings to hear him preach because he was really a very good preacher I, I remember some of when I was your age I remember um, when I was in middle school uh, listening to some of his sermons and I don't know if they had any kind of what kind of effect they had on me but I just I just remember some of his sermons. They were very good. He was a very good preacher, very powerful preacher. You know, and he spoke for 45 minutes. Um, and But I didn't really have any religious, I didn't go to a religious school, and I didn't really have any religious training, didn't really learn much about the Bible or about the church or anything when I was growing up. But I was Christian. I wasn't an atheist. You guys know what an atheist is? What's an atheist? Someone who doesn't God. Right. So I wasn't that. I was probably an agnostic. Does anybody know what an agnostic is? You should. Because an agnostic is probably, there are probably more agnostics in the world than atheists. An agnostic is someone who says, well, maybe there's a God and maybe there isn't. Who, how am I supposed to know? You know who, if there is a God, fine. But if there's not, then okay. So in other words, an agnostic is someone just who, who just says, we don't know. There's no way we know if there's a God or not. And I'd say probably most people are like that. that they don't necessarily deny that there's God, but they don't believe that if they found out that it, there was no God, they wouldn't be that disturbed. In other words, they just have sort of like, they're, they're sort of in this in-between state. They're not necessarily religious or Christian, and they're not necessarily agnostic. So I was in that, that's the way I was, when I was your age, that's probably where I was. It's like, yeah, maybe there is. And so I went through middle school and high school, and then I came to college. And I... I'm from Kansas, so I went to the University of Kansas, Rock Chalk Jayhawk, like Father Connor. You guys remember Father Connor? Mm -hmm. yeah. So he and I went to KU. He was younger than I was, so, but I met him at KU because we were both in a program called the Integrated Humanities Program, and it was a program of studies for all freshmen and sophomores at the University of Kansas in those days. And we, like I said, he was younger, but it was a class in history and in English and in um, 
speech and Western civilization. So it was, that's why they called it the integrated humanities. It concluded all these subjects together. And he, and he took this course as a freshman and sophomore. So it lasted two years. And it was um, four semesters. So your fresh, freshman year, freshman fall and spring, sophomore fall and spring. And it satisfied all your major requirements in college. So it satisfied your English requirement, your speech requirement, your Western Civ requirement, all this. And so it was a great class. And it kind of, because the University of Kansas, like the University of Nebraska, it was like 25,000. And so when you go off to school as a freshman, you know, there are like 5,000 kids in your class. Like, how can you get to know 5,000 classmates? You know, um, and so this was a way to kind of bring a little kind of smaller community together. And so we all were in this, and I remember my first semester, there were 150 in this big class. And I didn't really know anything about the class because it was not a religious class or anything. It was a, it was a class in the humanities. But it sounded interesting, and my best friend wanted to go in it, and we were roommates in college. And so we decided we would get in this program. And like I said, I really didn't have any belief in much of anything. But the unique thing was we read these great books. And you guys have probably read them too. You know, they were just books that had had an impact on history and on everything. And so for the first semester, we read the Greek authors. So we read books like, have you ever heard of the Odyssey? Have you read it? No. But you've heard of it? Yeah. Yeah, the Odyssey was really kind of the first classical work of literature written by Homer. I'm not talking about the Bible, because the Bible actually preceded the Odyssey. But this was the first work of Western civilization. So the story, it was a big poem. Actually, it was a long poem. And it was the history of Odysseus, who was this great leader who um, went away from his home in Greece, in Ithaca, to fight in the Trojan War. And the Trojan War was a great battle that took place about seven or 800 years before the birth of Jesus. And so this was one of the first books written about that. And so when you take a course in humanities or history, you have to read the Odyssey, because it's like the first book. And then there was another book called the Iliad, which was also by Homer. And Homer was this, uh, not Homer Simpson, <laughs> although he's probably named after Homer, the Homer. I don't even know if Homer had a last name. But he wrote these classic poems, they're actually poems, on the history of the Trojan Wars, the first history that we have. And so with the first semester, we read all of these Greek authors like Aesop's Fable. Have you heard about Aesop's Fable? There are the, these fables, these little fairy tales that are very famous, very ancient. We read Plato and Socrates and Aristotle. You guys heard of these, those yeah. names, right? These, are, these were the first philosophers, okay? Mm -hmm. They were all Greek philosophers. So they're the ones who really wrote and, and studied the way we think. You know, the very first philosophers. How do we think? Who are we? You know, where do we come from? Those kind of things. Without the benefit of any kind of religion, because they still believed in the Greek gods. You know, the gods that were in the constellations of stars. So, we read those books. And then the second semester, we read Roman authors. Um, like the Aeneid. And that's by Virgil. Have you ever heard of that name, Virgil? Virgil is another very, Virgil is probably just as famous as Homer. And Virgil wrote the Aeneid, which was another poem, and it was the story of the founding of Rome. And we know, and you guys probably know this, that Rome became the center of the world. And at the time of the birth of Jesus, Rome was the center of the Western world. The Roman emperor, Caesar ruled the world. And so Virgil wrote this story about the founding of Rome. And um, so that's a very important historical book. Because Rome is a big deal. Because Rome, Rome still is a big deal. 
In fact, I just got back from Rome because one of your parishioners, Father, now he's deacon, Matthew Schilmuller. Yeah. You guys know the Schilmullers? Mm -hmm. So Matthew was just ordained a deacon in Rome at St. Peter's Basilica, which is like the heart of the Vatican because he's going to school in Rome. And so we just came back from Rome. And you can still see the foundations of Rome. In other words, you can go and see the Roman ruins where this book took place, the story of the founding of Rome. So that was the second semester of the freshman year. We read the Roman authors. We read Caesar's Gallic Wars. We read um, Ovid. We read all of these Roman authors. And then the second year, we started with Christianity. And we read kind of excerpts from the Bible. Just little, like we read the book of Job. If you guys Are you guys familiar with the book of Job? We read the Psalms, some of the Psalms. We read Matthew's Gospel. But because this was a state university, like the University of Nebraska, they couldn't teach it as religion. They couldn't, you know, they couldn't teach it as a religion class. They had to teach it as literature and history. That's fine. And so we read that in the first year of my sophomore year, we read um, parts of the Bible. We read the Confessions of St. Augustine. It's the story of St. Augustine, who was a great saint, who really had an impact on the whole world. And he wrote this book called The Confessions, which was about his conversion to the, to the Catholic faith. And then we read Boethius, the Song of uh, Consolation of Philosophy. He was a philosopher. And we read The Life of Charlemagne, who was a great uh, emperor, Roman emperor. And then we read, we ended up that semester with The Little Flowers of St. Francis of Assisi, which again was not considered a religious book, but it was about St. Francis. And St. Francis is a saint that everybody loves no matter if you're Catholic or not, because St. Francis is so popular. Then the last semester we read, we went into the modern. So we read Canterbury Tales, this is about England, and we read Don Quixote, um, which is about Spain, and then we read um, Charles Dickens, have you heard of that author? Mm -hmm. He wrote The Christmas Carol, mm -hmm. wonderful story. We should read it, I try to read it every year, every year Christmas time. Great movies made on that. Um, and different modern authors. And we ended up reading, the last book we read in the whole thing was called The Oregon Trail. And it's about the Western pioneers going out. So, so you can see this course over two years. We started at the very beginning and ended up in modern day. And it was a history course. And as the students would read these great books, it became clear that through literature and poetry and music and you guys know who this is? Yes. Yeah. This is your principal, right? Mm -hmm. Sister Janelle. They know me well. They know you well. All right, I hope you don't have to go to her office a lot. No? Okay. You don't know her that way, huh? You spend, okay, anyway. So anyway, just to kind of sum it up and I'll kind of finish it up here because this is kind of the, this is the climax of my story. So after reading all this, I read, you know, like, especially in the pagan authors, the pre-Christian books, before the birth of Jesus, I discovered that these philosophers and these great leaders all believed in different gods, like Zeus. Have you ever heard of Zeus? Mm -hmm. Zeus is like the king of all the pagan gods. And, um, and Venus, she's like the goddess of all the, all the female gods. And then uh, all these other uh, Greek gods and Roman gods. And so I'm thinking like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm an agnostic, right? And I don't know, like, maybe God, there may be not God. But I better figure out what I believe. Because I knew that I was, I didn't have any belief in any, any God or anything. So then we read those Christian books. And so I started thinking Christianity and Jesus. And did he really did he really exist? And did he really sit, was he really who he said he was? Is he really the Son of God? The God, the one God. In other words, is there only one God? And did Jesus Christ come to save us from our sins? And did his was his death on the cross what saved us from our sins? And all these questions. And then I read these great saints like Augustine and Charlemagne, who was a great Christian king. And St. Francis, who was a great saint, and they all believed. And then, and then the other thing, too, not only was there something going on in, in my head about 
kind of from a philosophical thing, like where is God, who is he, does he exist? Then there was the impact that Christianity had on music, art, literature, poetry, science. And I discovered that the Catholic Church, you trace everything back to the Catholic Church. The greatest artists like Michelangelo and, um, and um, where am I drawing a blank? Who was the great Renaissance? The Leonardo da Vinci, and you know, all the greatest artists and the architects, and were all Catholic, and they were all painting and building things like Notre Dame and Chartres and these cathedrals to give glory to God because they believed. Music like Palestrina and Mozart, and Bach, and all these great symphonies and these composers were all writing music that came out of their faith. That they, that, that, that's inspired them to, to write the most beautiful music they could possibly write to please God. And the great poets and philosophers and theologians like St. Thomas Aquinas. And then these great saints like the North American martyrs who came to this country and suffered and were martyred because they wanted to spread this faith to a people that never heard of God before. And I'm saying like, all this kind of traces back to the Catholic Church. And so I, I started to look at the, well, I started church hopping. So I started going to different churches because I knew Christianity was probably what, what I would believe in. It made the most sense to me. The story of Jesus made sense to me. But so I started going to the Methodist church and then I started going to the Episcopal church because I read a lot of, you guys ever heard of an author called C.S. Lewis? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He wrote the Chronicles of Narnia. Yeah. Well, he wasn't Catholic, but he wrote a lot of, about Catholics, and he had a Catholic philosophy. So I started going to the Episcopal Church, which was the church he went to. So I thought, well, kind of, that's a safe place to be. I don't have to become a Catholic, because I think if I became a Catholic, I'd have to have all these rules, and I have to go to Mass every Sunday, and all these things. And, but I didn't want to remain a Protestant on this side, because they didn't have any of the history or the beauty, like C.S. Lewis talks about in the Chronicles of Narnia, and mere Christianity, and the science fiction trilogy. I don't know if you've read these science fiction trilogies. Beautiful. Out of the Silent Planet, Paralandra, and That Hideous Strength. So that, those books, they were all fiction, but they had a big impact on me. So I was in the Episcopal Church. I made a pit, as I say, I made a pit stop in the Episcopal Church for a little while. And then finally I realized that I can't stay here. I've got to go all the way. Because the Catholic Church became more and more convincing to me. Up here everything pointed to the Catholic Church because it's the only church that could trace itself all the way back to Christ through the Pope you know they had this apostolic history and that was one of the things history was important to me so I wanted to find the church that could convince me that it went all the way back to Jesus and all these other churches could only go back to like a certain time in history like the church I grew up in was a Presbyterian church and John Calvin was the founder of that church but he he was born in the 16th century so I want to go back further. Well, the Anglican, the Episcopal Church, that goes back to Henry VIII. That was 1530. So I said, I want to go back, I want to go all the way back to the beginning. And the Catholic Church was the only church that could prove to me historically that it had its origin back in the time of Jesus. And that there was this unbroken apostolic succession through, you know, the... 100s, 200s, 300s, 400s, 500s, and through the Middle Ages and, and into the Renaissance and into modern time that was, we could trace the whole history. And once that kind of light bulb went off, I said, well, this is where I gotta be. I gotta become a Catholic. And so I took these classes. And actually, the reason why I took them was I was interested, but my roommate was dating this girl. And he wanted her to become Catholic. So he convinced her to go to these classes if I would take her because he, she didn't want to go with him because that was too much of a conflict of interest. So she came with me and we went through these classes and for me, it just made sense. And uh, that's when I decided to become a Catholic. But there was one thing that I was, that, 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 and, I'll tell, and I'll end with this because it's a little, because it's kind of a funny story, but um, my grandmother who was Baptist and she, my dad was one of 10 kids and they were raised during the depression. And she was a very holy woman. And, and, and all of us grandkids knew that because she helped and fed so many people who were poor during the depression and during the war. 
and she was just a saintly woman and she had just died and I remember thinking gosh she's got to be in heaven but then I had this funny idea in my mind that well only Catholics are in heaven and everybody else is in hell which is wrong that's what I thought because I was thinking well I want to go to heaven so I guess I got to become Catholic and so the priest who was giving us the classes said I so I said so if you want to go to heaven you have to become Catholic and only Catholics are going to heaven and he said no he says he says let me tell you a story so you're so he said you know this guy goes before Peter in the pearly gates and so Peter starts walking him around heaven and he says now when we go by this room I want you to be real quiet so they went by this room and he looked in and all these people were kneeling and praying in there and he went by and said why do we have to be quiet when we went by that room is because those are the Catholics and they think they're the only ones up here and so I said so you don't have to become Catholic to go to heaven he said no Catholics are gonna go to heaven and Catholics are gonna go to hell Protestants will go to heaven and Protestants will go to hell everybody will be judged on how well they did with what they were given and to those to whom much is given much will be expected and so you could see in my mind I was thinking hmm if I don't have to if I don't have to become a Catholic to go to heaven I just might stay where I am because I don't have to kind of you know I knew that if I became Catholic I had to sort of clean up my act a bit and uh, you know change my lifestyle and just kind of go to mass every Sunday and all these kind of things and I wasn't quite you know I'm still in college so okay I'm 20 years old I'm halfway through my junior year so I said so you don't have to go to heaven or you don't have to become Catholic to go to heaven. He says, no. He says, but why walk when you can take the bus? I said, well, what do you mean by that? And he says, well, on the Catholic bus, you have everything you need. You got the fullness of the seven sacraments. You got the history of the church. You got the lives of the saints. You got the history of the popes. You've got the history of art, music, literature, poetry, all this. He says, if you get on that Catholic bus, you better make sure you're ready. And he said, because you'll have everything you need, and then you know, you'll have to kind of take ownership of your life. And, 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 be, and, and you can't go around just sort of like thinking, well, you know, be in the middle. And so he says, so maybe you're not ready. To, then he started playing with me. He says, maybe you're not ready to get on that bus. Of course, in my heart, I was saying, I got to get on that bus. You know, I want to be on that Catholic bus. And so, uh, and so I said, no, I, I want to become Catholic. I want to be on that bus. And it's okay, good. And so, um, in the end, I became Catholic. That halfway through my my junior year in college, I was twenty, and um, and I've never looked back. I've, I've never regretted that decision. I didn't. When I think back on it, I really didn't know that much. And like I like I was saying, and I'll end with this. I know I've said that before. I'll end with this because you guys can ask some questions. Just what I've told you kind of sounds like, and I used to say this, my conversion was sort of an intellectual conversion. I read my way into the Catholic Church, which is true to a certain extent. But when I look back on it, and the older I get, and I was just, I just went to a reunion with like, like four couples, four married couples. We were all in college together. We were all converts to the Catholic faith. We all became Catholic when we were in college. We just got together out in Red Cloud, and we rented an, a, an Airbnb, and we read these beautiful stories by Willa Cather, who's a Nebraska author. Um, anyway, so I was thinking, you know, it wasn't so much, my conversion wasn't so much an intellectual, although it was, but it was the friendships that I made, and the community. Remember I was talking about how big a university can be? But it was the community of these friends, and the example of these friends who were living their Catholic faith and who were very passionate about what they believed and there was a certain joy and peace and sort of a fearlessness and and happiness that I didn't have and they had those who were Catholic had that and I wanted that and I wanted to be like that and I wanted to believe like that and so it wasn't so much my mind, my brain, my, my intellectual, although that was part of it, it was my heart. You know, I wanted, to, I wanted to be part of this community of faith that had this clarity in their mind about 
who God was. And it doesn't mean life was any easier. I mean, they struggled with their own sinfulness. You know, they tried, you know, they made good choices and bad choices. They went to confession when they made bad choices. In other words, they, they were just like every, anybody else going through this world, trying to make their way. But they had a certain kind of uh, clarity and a certain kind of direction that I wanted and I didn't have. And so that in the end, and of course, there was boatloads of grace that God was, you know, invisible grace that he was pouring down upon me, which I couldn't see. No, we can't see grace. That led me more and more to the Catholic Church. Um, so, you know, looking back on it all, that's why I like to tell the story. Because, uh, it's you know, it's my story. And each one of you have your own stories. Most of you were probably born and baptized Catholic, right? Was anybody not? born and baptized Catholic? So no really, well, your teacher, but nobody else, right? So you've all, all you've ever known is the Catholic Church, right? And that's a blessing because, you know, you, you've had a, you, you have had a head start that I know, it took me 20 years to find the church. And so I could have been, those first 20 years of my life, I could have been growing in my friendship with Jesus and my so, you know, you, like I say, you, you have had um, a, a head start. But, um, you know, they say that sometimes converts appreciate the Catholic Church more than cradle Catholics because, you know, we come to it in our adult years. But we're all in this together, and we're all on the same adventure to, to eternal life. And um, so that's my story. And you guys have any questions? We have 10, 15 minutes left, so I'm sure there's some things that have been going through your mind. Don't be shy. You can ask anything. What's it like being a bishop? Uh, who's, your, what, who's your favorite NFL football team? Kansas City Chiefs. They had a great victory yesterday. Yeah. Beat San Francisco. Mm -hmm. You guys probably, well, maybe you didn't watch the game. Okay. Yes, ma'am. What maybe ah that's a good question. So what yeah so so here I am twenty years old and I'm a new Catholic. I had no clue that I would ever become a priest. In fact, I thought you had to be born Catholic to become a priest. So I thought it was out. I thought it didn't. Even, I thought it was not even open to me. So I really didn't think about. I didn't really think about becoming a priest to my first four or five years as a Catholic. I just thought, well, that's not an option. And plus, I'm a convert. And maybe they don't accept converts, you know. And so what happened there was really dramatic. And this is really providential because Saturday, the day before yesterday, the 22nd of October, was the feast day of St. John Paul II. Now, you guys have heard of St. John Paul II, mm -hmm. but you guys weren't born when he was pope. But he was the pope really for most of my lifetime. So he was pope for 27 years. So when I became a Catholic, Pope Paul VI was the Pope. But within, let's see now, I'm trying to think now. I was, became a Catholic in 1975, and John Paul II was elected Pope in 1978. So three years after I became a Catholic, Pope John Paul, and he was this unknown priest from Poland and young and he was very athletic he liked to climb mountains he liked to go skiing and he came to visit the united states for the very first time and i remember we all all my friends and buddies piled into vans and we drove up to see him and he came from all places to des moines iowa he came to like new york boston washington philadelphia chicago and des moines iowa <laughs> which was really kind of the closest place to us so you were born in des moines mm -hmm. Well, that's the, that was where the Pope came, and a very famous, that was October, I remember the date, October 4th, Feast of St. Francis, 1979. 300,000 people, in this, it, was this, it was this time of year, October, and it was a big, huge field called the Living History Farms. Do you remember that, those places? That's a famous place in Des Moines. And we all camped out at night, it rained, like it was cold like this, and we were freezing, and, and, and he came, and he, it was a morning mass, and, he flew in on a helicopter and he came down, he got out, and his first, and I'm a new Catholic, I've never seen a Pope before. So he comes out, he's in his white cassock, and he comes out and 
has this beautiful mass, and at the end, he, as he always would do, he says, young men, consider the priesthood. Follow, follow me with Christ. This is an adventure. And of course, we're just like, whoa. And I was actually dating a girl at the time. And so she could tell like I was, you know, there, that really shook me up. So to answer your question, I couldn't get it off my mind. You know, that from October 4th, the rest of the October and November, Christmas, in January, I was in the seminary. I broke with my girlfriend, I enrolled in the seminary, and I started studying for the priesthood within four months. So I have to say that if you had the simple answer to that, why I became a priest, Pope John Paul II, Saint John Paul II, his inspiration and his his call. He was he said he was speaking to us. He said, if you're a young man, consider this. And I considered it and said yes, and I haven't regretted it a day. So. Hope that answers the question. All right. Any more questions? You guys have some more questions. Don't be shy. Yes, ma'am. Who was your confirmation saint? My confirmation saint was Saint Augustine. Because remember, I told you I read that book, mm -hmm. and Saint Augustine in that book is probably one of the one of the most famous autobiographies ever written. Because St. Augustine was this brilliant philosopher in Rome. And he was like the, the, the most famous teacher, and he wrote these books. And, but he, was, he, was, he, was a, he wasn't even an agnostic, he was an atheist. He didn't believe in God. But he wrote these beautiful um, philosophical reflections on nature and beauty and the stars and all these things. And his mother was Catholic, and his mother prayed for him. And she she was she worried about his soul. And when he was thirty three, and he and he also he you know he was he lived a very sinful life. Um, you know he he you know got into everything that young people get into. You know, and he was just he was not living a very virtuous life. And when he turned 33, he just had this conversion. It was through another saint, St. Ambrose. And he changed his life around and became, you know, one of the greatest theologians in the history of the church and a saint. So I kind of saw my life like, not that I was a brilliant mind or anything, but I saw that my life was kind of like that, that I had lived this life of sort of, you know, I was into rock and roll and all this kind of stuff, you know. Great Beatles. Still am a great Beatles fan. You guys heard of Beatles before? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, and so I kind of saw my life turn like his. And so that's why I chose Augustine. Yes, ma'am. Um, was your family, like, supportive of you, like, being Catholic? Well, my mom was. <clears throat> she, did, she was just happy. One, that I cut my hair because I had real long hair. I had hair longer than yours, by the way. No, you. Yes. And, uh, and you know, they, everybody had long hair back then. And so she was, she was worried that I was, you know, this hippie and kind of, uh, you know, just confused. And so one of the first things I did, you know, when I became a Catholic, I cut my hair and kind of, I guess I cleaned up my act a bit. And, um, and uh, so she was, she, she thought that was good. My dad, he wasn't so happy because he thought... So he's this, he fought during World War II. He was a gunner on an aircraft carrier. So he would shoot down Japanese airplanes, you know, off the, sh off the side of a ship. Came back after the war, successful in business, kind of built a family, but he didn't have any religion at all. And he saw the Catholic Church. In fact, he told me, in fact, one, one thing I did, and I don't recommend doing this, one thing I did was I didn't tell my parents that I became so I came home from, I would, though I would not recommend that for anybody if they ask you, because I knew that my dad would not be happy. And so I just went ahead and became Catholic, and then came home, and it was a, it was a Christmas time. After, the, uh, after my, my first semester of my junior year, I think it was, I think it was actually a Christmas dinner. I said, you know, oh, by the way, uh, you know, I became Catholic at the, at the end of the semester. Can you pass me some potatoes, please? 
<laughs> and so my mom said, oh, really? That's nice. My dad said, I knew it. I could see this coming. Son, you're going to give up. You've just given up your freedom to think for yourself. The Catholic Church is going to make all your decisions for you. The Pope's going to make all your decisions for you. You're not going to be able to think on your own. And if that's what you want to do, you're an adult. That's your choice. I just want to let you know that. So he was not happy. Because he thought I, you know, because he was just like the self-made man. And, you know, you've got to think for yourself. And you've got to, you can't let people tell you what to do. And all those kind of things. And so, so fast forward 15 years. I'm a priest now. And uh, I'm in my first assignment, and a little unbeknownst to me, my parents kind of secretly start taking classes in the Catholic Church. And I get this letter from my mom saying, well, your father and I have decided that we want to become Catholic. And we have never been baptized, and so we want you to baptize us and to confirm us and to give us our first Holy Communion. And of course, I was thrilled. And so, August 1st of 1981, we had this ceremony in, at my parish, where I was my first parish as a priest. And so, my mom and dad, and a bunch of my priest buddies came, and my bishop came. And so we're there at the baptismal font, and my dad steps up, well, first of all, my mom, she's ladies first, so I baptized her first. And then my dad walks up, and so I couldn't resist it. I said, now, Dad, if I do this, you know you're going to give up your freedom to think on your own. <laughs> the church is going to make all your decisions for you. The Pope's going to make up all your, you know, every... And he's kind of like this. Come on. <laughs> Because he remembered what he said to me. And so I baptized him and then uh, confirmed him. So in the end, to answer your question, they weren't happy at first, but they eventually 